This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Church family, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. You know, there has never been a day of your life that you have not been loved. You are God's child, and he loves connecting with you through prayer. And prayer is not the same thing as worrying. Prayer is a time to cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That's a good word. And, and with that, let's begin our service with some prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us. Thank you that we're all here because you wanted us to be here. And I just believe, Father, that everybody who's in this building and watching on television, Lord, that something good is about to happen. Pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you'd speak to us, lift our hearts, and draw us closer to you. We pray all these things, of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, we are doing Psalm 23 again. We are doing it throughout the whole series, and we want it to be uh, more than just a scripture reading, but a time of meditation. 
So if you want to close your eyes during it or some posture that you're able just to kind of let it sink into your soul, um, I invite you to do that during this time. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Church. God is worthy of our trust. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is song. Hello, church family. In this new year, I want you to know that God is a healer. Everywhere he goes, he brings healing with him. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.24, God says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Friend, God has forgiven your sins. 
He has removed the shame of your past from your future. And He wants to heal your body, your brokenness, and your hurt so that you can be a source of healing to others. But sometimes in our effort to have faith for God to move in our lives, we don't accept our current reality. But faith without works is dead. We need to be the kind of people who trust that with God's help, we will 100% prevail in the end. But we also need enough discipline to look at our current reality and not become overwhelmed by our circumstances. With God's guidance, He gives you the power to change any area of your life. There is no tragedy God cannot redeem. He redeems death, He redeems sickness, and He can redeem all of the hurt you're facing in your life. You, child of God, can be healthy, healed, and whole. God wants to redeem and heal you today. I want to encourage you to take a step today and request these resources, which are filled with some scripture truths to build your faith and turn your hurt into healing. I pray that you allow the messages and content to seep into your heart and your mind and watch as God starts working miraculously in your life. And remember always, God loves you and so do I. Call, write, or go online today and request the Be Healed, Be Whole resources booklet, which is filled with uplifting scripture promises about God's desire to make you healed and whole. As you receive the life-changing truth of God's word about your healing from these resources, you'll be filled with hope and faith that God loves to work powerfully on your behalf and that nothing is impossible with God. We hope you'll reach out and connect with us so we can better encourage you. Don't wait to take a step out of your current circumstances. Remember always, God loves you, and so do we. Well, with us today is Chloe Howard, a young author and speaker with a story of challenges and triumphs. She offers encouragement to those going through their own struggles by showing them how to stand beautiful, which is actually the name of her children's book. Please welcome with me, Chloe Howard. Hi, Chloe. Hi. So um, a big part of your story actually has to do with being born with a foot deformity. And maybe we can just start there and how that's impacted your life and kind of where that led you. Yeah, so my parents were actually told that I may not be born alive. Uh, four months before I was born, my parents saw on the ultrasound a hole in my heart, two club feet, and were told that they should abort me. Um, by the grace of God, they didn't, and I was born four months later, happy and healthy. Miraculously, the hole in my heart was healed, and only one club foot remained. So I was born with a severely deformed foot, upside down and backwards, missing seven toenails, but I grew up loving my foot. And even though I had many surgeries to correct this deformity, I knew that God loved me, that my foot was special, yeah. and that I was worth it. You, your foot was actually born upside down and backwards. Yes. And, and, and I love that you didn't, as a child, you didn't, not only did you not care, you thought it was something that just made you special, and in a way yeah. it really was. I it actually is. believed that I had a superpower, that there was something secret and unique <laughs> about me that no one else had. Yeah. I grew up watching Veggie Tales. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but they had this line that they showed at the end of this children's show that said, you are loved and worth it. And this truth I felt like was proclaimed over my life. Yeah. And your parents, that same thing, right? You're a child of God, you know, yeah. you're a treasure to, to Christ and all this stuff it was ingrained in you. And then you sort of, that idea that you lived with was then one day challenged in a pretty profound way. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. My freshman year in high school in 2014, I was assaulted on my Christian high school campus because of my foot deformity. Uh, on November 20th, 2014, I was restrained, my arms held to my sides, and without my consent, I was lifted up, my sock and shoe ripped off, and my deformed foot held out in front of me. And I remember standing there in the lunch quad at this Christian school where I wanted to feel safe, looking at my little scarred, permanently discolored, toenailless foot held out in front of me, and for the first time in my life, I felt ashamed of the part of me I had always been told made me special. And I didn't know what or how God could work that out. It's interesting that that happened at a Christian school, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but this actually really led, I mean, in earnest, it led to a time of depression and self-doubt and a lot of, 
lot of the stuff, and this is still, I mean, you're only 18, right? So yeah. this is not that long ago, and in a time of an age of Instagram and things like that, it was probably very easy to, to and, and how, how did you get through that, and how did you break through all of that, that sort of dark period? Yeah, it was a really hard time for my life. I struggled with PTSD, depression, suicidal thoughts. Aww. I felt like this identity that I had grown up with of worthiness and beauty that came directly from God. Um, was completely rewired, and I didn't know who I was or how God could be working in this, but of course God showed up like he does, even in my anger and sadness. I ended up randomly meeting U2's Bono. Um, Let's say that again. The lead singer of the band, U2, yeah. Bono. Heard of him. Um, just a little bit. <laughs> Love him. Um, and ended up telling him my story, and he spoke truth over my life and said that what happened to me is an injustice. Did you just like see him at a cafe or like? My dad, so we're a family that doesn't win anything ever, but my dad randomly happened to win this contest through Omaze, which is based out of LA. Okay. Um, and so we were flown out to Denver. I told him my story, and he said, Chloe, wow. you need to start speaking out. And so that challenged me a year later at age 16 to give my first TED Talk. Um, and I stood up there barefoot on that stage, that iconic red TED circle and felt just overwhelmed with God's faithfulness. But I, th I think it's awesome. And, and so, so you wrote this children's book now, which has been a huge success. Thank Diane, you. who's uh, our, one of the producers of our show, really involved, her granddaughter loves your books. It's her favorite book. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's had a big impact on kids, it hasn't has. it? It has, yeah. I believe, I actually have written two books, the children's picture book and then the memoir, um, which is an autobiography. And I believe that the message of self-acceptance and love and anti-bullying and the worthiness that Jesus proclaims over us, um, all of which can be found on my website, sandbeautiful.me. That message isn't gender specific, isn't age specific. Everyone in this whole world needs to know that only they have the power to determine what their labels are and that society tries and labels us with these imperfections, but God looks down and calls each of us so beautiful and so worthy. Amen, that's the Christian message. Well, it's great. What would you say, just as a parting word, to maybe some other teenagers, college students, or anyone that, that really struggles with the self-doubt and just feeling like there's something wrong with them or some part of their body they don't like or something like that, what would you say to them? I would say that you are so worthy that society tries and throws these things at us. Um, and a lot of our time, we can sit in this moment and feel crushed by the weight of the reality. Um, but the truth is that God has a plan for us that is so much bigger and greater than anything we could ever imagine. Um, so you're not alone in what you're going through. There is life beyond this dark time and God redeems us every single day. Such a great word, Chloe. Thank you. Chloe Howard, everyone, thank you. God bless you for your message. We appreciate you.
as we move into a time of our morning's offering. I'm reminded, Bobby's speaking today about trust, and, and you know, being generous involves trust. You know, giving something away doesn't always come naturally. It involves trusting the words of Scripture, the promises of God, and God promises to be faithful. And that faithfulness we can trace back into our past. We can look at it in the present, and we can also look at it in the future for what is to come. And so with that in mind, I'd like to invite the ushers forward as we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Hello, church family. In this new year, I want you to know that God is a healer. Everywhere He goes, He brings healing with Him. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.24, God says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. Friend, God has forgiven your sins. He has removed the shame of your past from your future, and He wants to heal your body, your brokenness, and your hurt, so that you can be a source of healing to others. But sometimes in our effort to have faith for God to move in our lives, we don't accept our current reality. But faith without works is dead. We need to be the kind of people who trust that with God's help, we will 100% prevail in the end. But we also need enough discipline to look at our current reality and not become overwhelmed by our circumstances. With God's guidance, He gives you the power to change any area of your life. There is no tragedy God cannot redeem. He redeems death, He redeems sickness, and He can redeem all of the hurt you're facing in your life. You, child of God, can be healthy, healed, and whole. God wants to redeem and heal you today. I want to encourage you to take a step today and request these resources, which are filled with some scripture truths to build your faith and turn your hurt into healing. I pray that you allow the messages and content to seep into your heart and your mind and watch as God starts working miraculously in your life. And remember always, God loves you and so do I. Call, write, or go online today and request the Be Healed, Be Whole resources booklet, which is filled with uplifting scripture promises about God's desire to make you healed and whole. As you receive the life-changing truth of God's word about your healing from these resources, you'll be filled with hope and faith that God loves to work powerfully on your behalf and that nothing is impossible with God. We hope you'll reach out and connect with us so we can better encourage you. Don't wait to take a step out of your current circumstances. Remember always, God loves you and so do we. Thank you for joining us today. We're so grateful that you're a part of this program. And if you're ever in Irvine, come down to Irvine Presbyterian Church and worship with us. We'd love to meet you. Friends, will you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this creed together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. What a good word that is from the Lord to you. It's the gospel, not by works, not by good looks, not by money, not by reputation, but merely by God's love towards us, especially exemplified through Christ crucified. What a great word that is. Well, today we're talking about this idea in Psalm 23, the idea that a person like David uh, could say something like, I lack nothing that even when he's being chased and has lost everything and he's thirsty and he doesn't know where his next meal is gonna come from, David was the kind of guy that lived with this weird sufficiency on the inside. Weird is truly the word. We'll get to that in a second. But imagine that, that someone could actually say, the Lord's my shepherd, I lack nothing. And I want you to know that's true for you. Yeah, you might have shortcomings, you might have mistakes, addictions, things you wrestle with, doubts and fears, but no matter what, I want you to know the Lord is your shepherd, that you lack nothing, that he takes you uh, by streams of living water, that when you're with him, you can lay down in green pastures and to your heart's content, eat whatever you need, that your cup overflows, that you have tremendous abundance, not only of of, of what you need through resources, but time and joy and love and, and all of these things. I want you to know that that is a real thing that the Lord offers us. 
And today we're going to talk about some of the keys to freeing that up in our life so that we really can feel it. First of all, the word, um, the idea of saying, I lack nothing, that's really a weird thing to say, isn't it? It's, it's better and more normal to say, I'm busy. <laughs> it's normal to say, I'm so stressed out. It's normal to say, oh, I don't know, I'm, I don't, I don't know, I'm gonna pay my bills. Those are what normal people say. It's the weird people that say, I have everything I need. I lack nothing. Imagine going into work tomorrow and somebody greets you, hey, Bill, how you doing? You say, well, as a matter of fact, because the Lord is my shepherd, I just lack nothing. Everybody be like, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the thing is, the default in culture is to be in need, to be hurried, to not have enough, to worry, to lack. This is one of the ways people actually manage you. This is the way people can make sure and handle you and make sure that you do what you're supposed to do is by uh, leaning into your lack. And this is one of the great things that we receive when we get into this new mindset of the gospel that the Holy Spirit, you know, through favor and grace that God gives us everything we need right when we need it. That we can wake up in the morning and in our minds and hearts, no, I lack nothing. I can be generous today. I can give peace today. I can be unhurried today. I can love my neighbor today. See, when we feel like we don't have enough, when we lack everything, then we live for ourselves. We put the walls up. We become defensive. We don't want to hear anything, anyone that disagrees with us. But when we live from a place of sufficiency, we give, we trust, we love, we fight for people that need us. And this is what we talked about a bit last, last week. Last week, we talked about Satan, an interesting topic, and the way that he does this to us, that that as in chess, great chess players always have the same opening move. Satan always has the same opening move. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Or a better way of saying it, that he makes you obsessed about your physical needs, even though they're good needs, right? You have to eat, you have to... You know, he makes us obsessed over these things. He makes us obsessed over the, the lust of the eyes. That is how we look, our reputation, being respected, and then that leads, of course, to obsession with ego, that how dare you say that to me? Don't you know who I am? Being offended, putting walls up. And this is the way that Satan twists the things that we really need and causes us to deceive ourselves into putting walls up and retracting and shrinking our world. Well, God frees us into a life of sufficiency with the three opposite things of those, and, he'll, and when we trust and lean into these things, our world expands, becomes bigger, becomes more sufficient. We truly, really do overflow with everything that we need. And if you have a pen, write these down. We're only going to talk about one of them today. But the three keys that open up this life without lack are uh, faith first, death to self is the second one, and agape love is the third one. We're going to talk about those two next week. But first, we have to talk about faith because if you don't have faith, you can't go into a place of death to self and agape love. Your love for others and your, your sort of death to self will often be fragile and, and legalistic, and that's not good. Well, we talk a lot about this idea of faith in churches. We must. We're saved by grace through faith, as our confessions and creeds and the scriptures say. Very often when we talk about faith, we give it this very mystic thing, faith, you know, like it's, like it's this like magical thing. And though it is magical in a sense, it's not as mystic as you might think. It's faith is very simple. It just merely means to trust. It means to trust. When you have, when all of you who came in this morning and sat in your pew, you had faith in your pew, presumably. Most of you did. You, you probably didn't before you sat in it go like, all right, let me see here. Check and make sure all the screws are right. Kind of wiggle it a little bit, make sure it was... You know, a lot of us had a lot over Christmas, maybe. You know, I don't know if it's going to hold me. <laughs> no, I mean, you just sat in it, right? Most of us did. You had faith that your pew would hold you up for an hour or so. There's no reason to doubt that. So even, yeah, there's no reason for any of us to doubt that. And, and we have tra trust in all sorts of things. Uh, faith is, uh, is this reliance on something in both attitude and action. That means that you, you have an attitude and a posture of faith no matter what. And faith is a gift. 
Faith is a real gift. It's a gift from God. It's not something we drum up. It's something that God gives us. That's why if you have a little bit of faith, I think that that's enough. God can turn your little bit of faith into a lot of faith. It's this wonderful story in Mark chapter 9 where there's this father and he has a son who's been demon-possessed since he was just a little boy. And this has caused all sorts of harm to this kid and he's been trying to help his kid be better and now his kid's an adult and he brings this boy to Jesus' apostles and they do all they can to try and cast this demon out and nothing happens. And finally the father sees Rabbi Jesus a ways off and he brings his boy along with him who's writhing and has all of these weird things and he says, Jesus, heal my son. And he says to him, if you can do anything, please just do it. And Jesus responds to him, if I can do anything? That's what the scriptures say. And then responds, anything is possible for him who believes. And then I love the father's response. It's like something out of a Russian novel. It's perfect. He looks at, the, at Jesus and he says, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. You ever feel that way? Who here has felt that way? I believe Help me with my unbelief. I believe I don't believe. I believe with all my heart. I believe with a little bit. This is a part of the Christian faith. That there are times in our lives where you say, I do believe, but I don't believe. It's this weird double-mindedness. And very often, we feel guilty about that. Like, we feel like, I need to believe 100% no matter what. Well, guess what? Faith is a gift from God. It's not something you will. It's not something you can make happen. It's a gift from God. And just give the part of you that believes, give it to the Lord in the same way that this father had enough belief to bring his son to the Lord. Have enough faith in the Lord to bring your needs to God when you need them. It's okay if you have a little bit of doubt. Isn't that freeing? Don't feel guilty for times when you feel... Feel doubt, that's okay. We all feel that way. Even pastors. Sometimes pastors most of all, everyone. And that is, that is okay. Faith is a gift, so don't feel guilty about not having faith. Merely have enough faith to take action and to change your attitude. Um, faith, as I said earlier, is a reliance on something in both attitude and action, but sometimes it's only action only. So great example is like an airplane. Is anybody a little nervous when they fly on airplanes? So you ne none of you fly then. <laughs> like I fly all the time, and I, I feel nervous sometimes. Actually, when I first started flying a lot, I used to be way more nervous, and as I'd walk in the plane, I'd like put my hand on the little like logo of the plane as I'm walking through and say a little prayer. Very superstitious. <laughs> And then I remember once I forgot to do that as I was starting to relax and trust the plane. I was like, oh man, I hope we make it. <laughs> I hope we make it. But that's true. The more you take action in life, according to your faith, the more your attitude will change. Faith is not all of this big mystical stuff. It's merely trusting God with my attitudes and my actions and my life. You can't live without faith in something or someone because faith is tied to the future. If we don't have faith, we become crippled uh, by worry and we can accomplish nothing. But the opposite happens when we're full of faith, when we trust the Lord, the kingdom of God is totally opened up to us and we truly can do anything if we believe. And this is the wonderful thing about the kingdom of God. In the scripture, there are three types of, uh, of faith. There's more than three, but these are three that really stand out, uh, well, at least to Dallas Willard, uh, in the in the scriptures, and the first is uh, faith of propriety. This is, because I do what is good and right, God will, go, God will be there for me. Because I've followed the, the list of things you're supposed to do, or we might say because I have been wise, or because I've looked for advice, or because I've planned everything out, God will do what he said he would do. Um, this is the faith that Job has at the beginning of the story of Job. Uh, Job honors God, sacrifices things to God, worships God, and Satan goes to the Lord and says, and God says to Satan, look how great my servant Job is. He loves me, he adores me. And Satan, of course, says, well, that's just because you've given him all this stuff. He's rich and he's healthy and everything's going great in his life. Take it away and watch what happens to his faith. So Satan essentially says, it's only a faith of propriety. 
And he's insinuating that he only trusts in you because, and he, he only trusts in you because you've given him uh, all these things. Um, but I just want to say that that faith, that faith of propriety, that God blesses a faith of propriety still, even though it's not the ideal kind of faith, especially for new believers or uh, children or teenagers or people in their 20s, I, I do see God respond to a faith of propriety. We sort of need that early on uh, in our faith. And, and I think it's okay. Maybe you're there today and you're doing everything right, well, and, and you say, well, God's blessed me, and he, he just probably did. Every, everything that's good in our life comes from God. But very often, we do everything right in our faith and everything starts to fall apart. And then we have a crisis of faith and we wonder, well, where is God now? And this leads to the second kind of faith, a faith of desperation. Have you ever been there before? Maybe you're there now. Uh, this uh, leans into that old saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole, right? When things are really, really, really bad and you haven't been to church in a while, you haven't opened your Bible in a while, haven't prayed, but things get horrible in your life, all of a sudden you run to God. I want you to know that God honors that kind of faith too. Isn't that great? God is so merciful and joyful and generous that, uh, that even the atheist in the foxhole, God will hear his prayer and respond even though he's desperate. And this is the faith, again, that Job has when everything is taken from me. When Job is there and with a piece of clay, he is scraping the boils on his skin. And in that season, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's the faith that, that parents in particular have when they come uh, running to the Lord for their child, the same faith that this father had. Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. He's just like, whatever you need, just please help my son. It's uh, the faith that the, the apostles have when they wake up Jesus in the storm. They're all great sailors, but their propriety has failed them, and they don't think Jesus is a great sailor. They just assume in their desperation that he's going to be able to do something about the storm. It's the faith that the Syrophoenician woman had when she came to Jesus, and Jesus seemingly says the meanest thing I've ever heard almost anyone ever say. I want to just, I don't know if I have time to talk about it, but this is very much like the last scene of Willy Wonka. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to watch Willy Wonka. It's, it's like the gospel. It's great. The Syrophoenician woman comes to, to Jesus and she says, Lord, heal my daughter. There it is again. And Jesus looks at her and says, do the dogs eat from the food that is set out for the children? What, she, what he's saying is Syrophoenicians are dogs and Jews are God's true children. Okay, now if you've read the gospel, you know that Jesus doesn't care anything about the difference between Samaritans, Syrophoenicians, or Jews. And you know that Pharisees and apostles are, are watching, and probably those Pharisees were like, yeah, get him, Jesus. This Jesus guy ain't so bad, you know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and her response, not offended, not bothered at all by, by that, her response, what does she say, you remember? Even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. Total desperation, please, I don't care, just heal my child. And you can almost see Jesus like jump up and down and go, look, this is great faith. This is what I'm talking about. She's only one of two people in the whole gospels that Jesus says has great faith. The reason he said that was not for her. I still feel like she does not even know what, what this is about. But the, the apostles and the Pharisees and others who may be watching, he's like, this is great faith. And of course, the daughter is healed. And this is the faith of, of desperation. Last scene of Willy Wonka, um, you know, all of the kids have gotten knocked out and finally Charlie's the last one and he's supposed to get, you know, a lifetime supply of chocolate. And uh, he's there with Willy Wonka, Gene Wilder, and the grandpa. And, the gra and uh, G you know, Gene Wilder dismisses him. And, uh, and then the grandpa says, but, but what about uh, Charlie's pr prize? He says, what prize? He says, the lifetime supply of chocolate. And Willy Wonka says, he doesn't get any. And he says, well, why not? He says, because you broke the rules. And the grandpa says, what rules, Charlie? We didn't see any rules. And then, of course, Willy Wonka goes into this crazy thing. He goes, wrong, sir, wrong. <laughs> he, 
He signed this document, and you can see for yourself clearly on this photostatic copy, I, the undersigned, etc., etc., forfeit all rights and privileges, etc., etc. <laughs> Felix Axe Mindian Cottom. It's right there, crystal clear, black and white. He stole fizzy lifting drink. I don't remember it all. <laughs> now the tunnels have to be cleaned and washed and sterilized so you get nothing. Good day, sir. <laughs> and then with that, the grandpa says, come on, Charlie, we're gonna go give the thing to, what was his name? I can't even remember all that line, I don't remember, Slugworth. <laughs> and so they're walking out of the thing and you know, Char little Charlie, brokenhearted, takes this thing that he could get a million dollars and help his family if he sells it to Slugworth and instead walks back to, Ms. to Willy Wonka and like puts it on his desk and he says, Mr. Wonka, and then like walks out. It's like, really, the sweet scene. And then what happens, you know, Willy Wonka grabs it and he goes, Charlie, you won, you won, you did it. And, uh, and, and he was testing him, you know, to see if he was truly a, a boy of character. This is how Jesus is, the whole point of this. This is, how Jesus, this is what Jesus is doing with the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus is, to everyone, seemed a little bit crazy, like a wizard, but, but, uh, but, but he really wasn't. He was, he was just opening up the whole world to these people who had, who had put God into this little, narrow, horrible box that the, the Pharisees had created for them, this sort of wrathful God of propriety. And Jesus was just opening up this whole world to them. Look at the, the, the grandeur and the joy that God takes in blessing his children. That was a God that the Pharisees couldn't, could not imagine. It was the God of the Old Testament. Okay. So, uh, so that's what happens when we're in this place of, of lack and, and desperation. We have faith and we turn to God and God responds to that because he's so good and gracious. But when we come through those seasons, very often it finally brings us to the best kind of faith, or the truest kind of faith, and that is a faith of sufficiency. The faith of sufficiency. It's a faith that Job has at the end of his story. It's the faith that the apostles have after they're full of the Holy Spirit, that even when they're persecuted or when things aren't going their way, they lack nothing. That they just say, Lord, I trust you. I've just, you've been too good to me, too gracious, too kind. And it's that, it's that kind of faith, sufficiency faith, that gives the miracle working power and wisdom and knowledge and influence that they can truly say, I lack nothing, I lack nothing, just like Psalm 23. It's this kind of faith that James is talking about in James chapter one, when he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because that you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. You gotta let it finish. Let perseverance finish its work. Why? So that you may be mature, and complete, not lacking anything. Mm, I wanna be that way. That is the faith of sufficiency. That when you've been first through that place of propriety, oh, I'm doing everything right, everything's going right, and then everything falls apart, and then you have that faith of desperation, where is God, I trust in you anyway, Lord help me. And then you come through and you persevere and you endure the suffering, the, the great gift, is in the older ages of our faith as we pursue God, we can truly wake up in the morning and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He's just nourishing my soul at all times, giving me everything I need. I'm everything I need to be. I have everything I need to have. God will give me everything I need right when I need it. I can trust him. Amen? The faith of sufficiency. And it's this kind of faith that just opens up a whole world. And particularly, it allows us to move into this place of death to self and agape love, which we'll talk about next week. But for now, I just wanna close with these two thoughts. What do we do now? First, again, faith is a gift. You can't manufacture faith. You can't will faith in your life. It's a gift from God. This is why I don't worry about people who have a little bit of faith. If you have a little bit of faith, like a seed, just hold on to it and carry it in your soul and it will grow into a lot of faith. If you need more faith, just ask for it and God will give it to you. If you say like that man, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief, God responds to that kind of a prayer and he'll give you more faith in greater measure as you need it, a faith of sufficiency. 
And finally, the second thought, and this is very important. I, I know this through the, not only the scriptures, but through experience. When faith moves, it moves in groups. Faith moves in groups. Uh, you can definitely see that in the great moves of God that have happened over the last, you know, the thousands of years. But just look, think of these many stories. The story of when Jesus goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, and the scriptures say that he was unable to do any miracles there because none of the people in Nazareth believed in Jesus. They just no, there was just no faith to be seen in the city, and that's when J Jesus famously says, a prophet, what, how does it go? The prophet has no honor in his hometown or something like that. When Jesus goes to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, there are people weeping and mourning, and, uh, and he says, don't be sad, she's only sleeping. And of course they laugh, she was dead. Even back then, people knew the difference between someone who was dead and someone who was sleeping. And in their laughing, Jesus dismisses them all. And it says that until they left, like that he needed to have people of faith there. So the only people that he would allow in the room were, I think it was Peter and James. Or another story when the man, the lame man, they dig a hole through the roof and they lower the man through the roof um, to be healed by Jesus and he heals them. And remember what he says? He doesn't say that the man who was lowered had faith. He says his friends had faith. All of you had faith. So I found very often that faith moves in groups. This is simply to say, get around people of faith. Get around people of faith. And let me, say, let me say, when I say get around people of faith, I'm not saying get around Christians because there are lots of Christians who don't have any faith at all. When I say get around people of faith, I mean people who trust in the Lord, people who you, you see really are full of faith, who pray with power and authority, people who you can clearly see death to self and agape love is, is evident in their actions towards their neighbor, people who freely give peace and aren't hurried when they need to be hurried, are relaxed when they should be afraid, uh, people who are full of faith. The kind of person that you would, the one person you could think of, if you thought, okay, if I was gonna make a list of three people that I would want to pray for me uh, if I you know, had cancer or something, those are the three people you wanna start hanging out with. And it doesn't mean you don't hang out with people that don't have faith, right? We must always love our neighbor and we don't wanna live in a bubble. But notice that faith moves in groups. If you want faith in your life, be in a faith, faithful group. God is the author of our faith. And uh, he gives it freely to those who ask. Maybe you're in a tough place today. I want you to know, I, I believe very much that God has written the last chapter of your life. Very often we don't know all the stuff in the middle, but just like you can turn to the back of a novel and look at what's gonna happen at the end of your life, I want you to know it's gonna be good. You can trust in the Lord from chapter one to chapter 17 or whatever it is. And whatever it is you're going through, I want you to know you're not alone. Not only is, is God with you, but we're with you. Look around at these people in this church. We love you, we're with you, you're not alone in whatever it is you're going through. And you can trust that God will bring you. He will, he will respond to, to your faith, he will. Trust in him and, and things will change. So Lord, we ask for faith. Many of us say with conviction here, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Many of us, Lord, only 1% of us can believe. 99% doubts, but 1% believes. Lord, we lean into that 1%, we give it to you. And we ask that you would receive it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.